This hour of the Costa Report is brought to you by Dole Food Company, the world's leading producer and distributor of fresh fruits and vegetables. Welcome to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and thank you for joining me for another two hours of Straight Talk Radio. I want to welcome members of our armed forces who are joining us from remote locations over the Internet and listeners tuning in on new radio affiliates in Hawaii, California, New Hampshire, Florida, Tennessee, and Minnesota. Thank you for being with us today. In just a moment, one of our country's most respected journalists and news anchors, Mr. Jim Lair, will be joining the program to give us some insights on what goes on behind the scenes of a presidential debate and why the journalists who ask the questions seem to be as much a part of the story as the candidates themselves. But before Mr. Lair joins us, as is my custom each week, let me tell you a little about his background. James Charles Lair was born in Wichita, Kansas, and grew up in Beaumont and San Antonio, Texas. He is a graduate of Victoria College and the University of Missouri. His career began when he became a reporter for the Dallas Morning News in 1959. He later joined the Dallas Times-Herald, where he covered the assassination of John F. Kennedy and rose to become the city editor. From here, Lair tackled television. He became the host of the Newsroom on Kara TV in Dallas, and later moved to Washington to join PBS as the Public Affairs Coordinator. But what you may best know Mr. Lair for was his unique partnership with Robert McNeil during the Watergate hearings and the McNeil-Lair Report, which resulted from their unique collaboration. In 1995, with McNeil's departure, the program was renamed The News Hour with Jim, L- Mc- with Jim Lair and later the PBS News Hour. Lair stepped down as anchor of the program in 2011, but only after earning several Emmys, the George Foster Peabody Broadcast Award, and just about every acknowledgement given for journalism excellence. In short, Lair set the standard. And if our research is correct, while he was anchoring his landmark news program, Mr. Lair found time to moderate 12 presidential debates and author several best-selling books. It's my pleasure to welcome to the Costa Report the man who has been called the Dean of Moderators, Mr. Jim Lair. Thank you for joining us today, Mr. Lair. Well, thank you, Rebecca. I'm, I'm honored by your introduction, and I'm honored to be uh, present with you. Thank you. Well, I'm so glad you could make time to be with us. As you know, we just had the first of the GOP candidate debates. And just out of curiosity, what did you think about the format and the questions? Well, it's a very complicated issue. Uh, the, the, uh, The debates for the primaries, in other words, the nomination debates are very different than the general election debates. So they, the, the rules have to be different. And also you have in the Republican case, you have 17 candidates. So uh, they couldn't all fit, or at least the decision was made, they couldn't all fit on, and on one stage at one time. So they had to divide them up. And uh, I think there probably could have been a way they could have done it. But uh, uh, I, I don't, uh, I, you know, the, I'm, 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 I'm no, I don't have a, I don't have a, a, a better way of doing it uh, than the way they ended up doing it. I thought that from the standpoint of uh, just as a viewer, it was very interesting. I thought that the people who asked the questions, in other words, the journalists, asked uh, real questions for the most part, and uh, they were uh, some of them uh, extremely difficult, but they were professionally. Uh, uh, offered, I thought. Uh, so generally speaking, it was uh, an interesting 90 minutes or two hours, whatever whatever it was, depending on when you were counting. Now, I've been watching election debates going back to Kennedy and Nixon. My parents yeah. used to sit us in front of the radio and the television. And, and for reasons I, I can't explain, this debate struck me as being very casual for such an important decision that the country's going to make. I mean, there was part of me that wants the structure and the moderators to treat the debates and and also the candidates more seriously, more respectfully. After all, we're we're talking about the highest office in the world. Am I being a stick in the mud? No, you're not. I I, I couldn't agree with you more. I I, I particularly feel I feel strongly uh, about that in terms of the general election uh, debates in particular, and I think the Commission on Presidential Debates runs those debates in in, in a very old-fashioned, uh, stick-in-the-mud way, to, to use your term, and I and I agree with that. This is serious business. There is uh, there is, there are no stakes uh, in in the world of American politics, or maybe possibly even world politics, that are higher 
than uh, than those at uh, at these presidential debates. So I agree with you. It, they are serious ma- they are serious events and they should be considered that and they should be uh performed that way they should be presented that way and everybody who participates should uh, keep that in mind and everybody who watches should keep that in mind i agree with you yeah there was just something about this tone that struck me more as a carnival type of atmosphere like a game show or something and i I, I just it just struck me as the wrong tone. Uh, but let's talk about what happened immediately after the first debate. Um, all of the media's attention seemed to focus on Donald Trump's claim that he was targeted by Megyn Kelly. So as a person who has moderated 12 debates, were, were you surprised by all that hubbub? You know, I really wasn't. Uh, the, uh, this has happened before, four years ago, also in, in some Republican debates, uh, uh, Newt Gingrich uh, attack the moderator in that case John King at a of CNN. It's 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 good mileage, and people know that. Um, and a candidate uh, who is particularly a candidate who uh, has uh, anyhow it, it it is always fertile territory to attack the moderator if you've got some juice, if you've got some uh, if you have an 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 attack that's based on something and people want to go if, if, if partisans. Uh, are always going to side against the moderator if the moderator asks a question that in some way is interpreted as not necessarily negative, but is interpreted as being uh, difficult for uh, for his or her candidate to answer. And so it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a it's, a, it's a good thing for them to do. So when 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 Trump did what he did, I was surprised the way he did it, and I thought he went to, and he went very strong with it. Uh, but to attack the moderator is uh, there, there, there's there's precedent for that. I don't know. That just it seems kind of a, I don't know, like a, a gimmick or something to go after the moderator if if all else fails. I, I mean, any time there's a debate, the moderator comes under scrutiny. And this even happened to you in 2012, where half the audience was delighted that you let the candidates address each other in the debate. And the other half criticized you and said you didn't take control of the debate. Can you talk a little bit about your decision to let the candidates talk to one another? Well, I'm glad, I'm glad you asked about that. I because yes, you're exactly right. There were there were I was criticized for for letting it go at the same time praised for 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 letting it go. Um, the, the the bottom line for me was I signed on to let it go. That is what the the Commission on Presidential Debates wanted. They wanted to move to a, a more open format, and they 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 asked me. Uh, as the moderator uh, to do that, and and the candidates were so informed, uh, there was no and 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 the public was so informed. I mean, in other words, I said that at the very beginning, and then I tried everything I could to get it open, get it opened up. And once it did get opened up, I left it alone. And my feeling was that um, I did what I set out to do. Now, some people uh, criticized me because they wanted they they felt that it it needed to be more. One minute here, one two minute, one minute, two minute. Two. Well, that's the way they've always been. But in this case, the debate commission. Not I, I didn't make that decision. The debate commission made the decision uh, to open it up, and they just wanted me to facilitate that, and that's what I tried to do. Well, that's one of the things I've admired about you as a moderator is you never tried to make yourself part of the story. I'm wondering in this last GOP debate, did you feel that they were trying to you know, make themselves part of the story? Unfortunately, we're going to have to take a hard break, but I'd, I'd like to explore that a little bit because sure. I, you know, it's such an opportunity for a moderator. I wonder, uh, well, first of all, I would never do it because, <laughs> because no matter what you do, somebody's going to be unhappy. <laughs> with you but but uh but it's such an opportunity and so i wonder if there if some moderators do wind up positioning themselves in such a way that they make themselves part of the story and i think that's just uh, absolutely opposed to what i think a moderator ought to be doing but let's take that up on the other side of the break uh, stay right where you are we'll come, when we come back we're going to find out why some questions never seem to come up in the debates you're listening to the costa report I'm here today with Scott Caraccioli of Caraccioli Cellars Wines. 
So where is the Caraccioli Vineyard located, and what varietals do you grow there? Our vineyard's right outside of Gonzales in the Salinas Valley. It's on the inland side of the coastal foothills. So it's basically, if you're driving out of Gonzales and you're on Gonzales River Road, you'll hit River Road, and it'll be the bench in front of you. And we only grow two varietals on the whole vineyard, Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. It's about 38 different blocks and 124 acres, so it's planted like a true winemaker vineyard with a lot of different clonal and rootstock combinations changing every few acres, so we're really able to take advantage of specific spots in the vineyard and farming them ideally for that place in that vineyard, that clone, and that altitude. Visit the Caraccioli Tasting Room on Dolores Street in Carmel-by-the-Sea, or find us online at caracciolicellars.com. Or reach us by phone, 831-622-7722. As a scientist who works hard to stay on top of current events and trends, I know how easy it is to get caught up in the details of a story and lose sight of the big picture. What is happening to society as a whole? Where are we headed? Why does it feel as if there's greater instability, unrest, and danger in the world? The truth is, very few of us have time to contemplate these questions. And if we're waiting for our leaders or the media to paint a clear picture, well, we may be in for a long wait. That's why I'm urging you to grab a copy of The Watchman's Rattle. Do it now. Go to RebeccaCosta.com. Find out why scientists, government leaders, and the heads of the largest corporations in America are waking up to a newly uncovered pattern of human behavior. That's The Watchman's Rattle at RebeccaCosta.com, a bestseller in 26 countries and a book that Richard Branson, Donald Trump, and experts everywhere are calling a must-read. That's The Watchman's Rattle, available at bookstores everywhere and online at RebeccaCosta.com. Hi, this is Erica Fisher. I'm a certified personal trainer at the world-famous Chaminade Resort right here in Santa Cruz. I've got some good news for you. Right now, I will award to the first five people who call me a free introductory personal training session at the ultra-luxurious state-of-the-art fitness center right here at the Chaminade in Santa Cruz. This personal training session will include a personal assessment, setting goals, and an introduction to using the equipment customized to meet your special situation. So call me right now at 831-588-7090. And if you're lucky enough to be one of the first five callers, I will be seeing you at the Chaminade Fitness Center for a one-on-one free appointment. 831-588-7098. Call now. 831-588-7098. EricaFitness.com. Mid-County Auto Supply in Capitola is your complete neighborhood automotive parts and marine supply store. Whether you're looking for starters, alternators, impellers, water manifolds, filters, batteries, or car care products, our parts pros will find what you need. At Mid-County Auto Supply, we stock the highest quality DECA batteries, proudly made in the USA for the highest performance for your car, truck, motorcycle, or boat. We also carry boat trailer parts, towing supplies. We offer machine shop services. Just ask for Dan for all of your boating needs. And don't forget to ask JT for free fishing stories. Se habla espanol. Drop on by and visit our friendly professional counter staff for service you can depend on. From parts to waxes, we have it all at Mid-County Auto Supply. Open since 1970, Mid-County Auto Supply is located at 4310 Capitola Road in Capitola. Call us today, 476-3600. That's 476-3600. We're here for you seven days a week. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and my guest today is legendary news anchor and best-selling author Jim Lair. And before the break, you were making the point that uh, the structure of the debate you moderated in 2012 was to allow the candidates to address each other. And so uh, that had been decided far in advance. And as a result, when they began speaking to one another, you didn't intervene. Uh, Yet, There were a lot of viewers who weren't aware of that, and they were critical that you uh, didn't stop the candidates. Uh, And it was a shame that that point wasn't made, I think, in advance. Well, I agree with you, Rebecca. In fact, I I regret very much that, uh, not very much, but I regretted very much at the time afterward 
that um, more people didn't understand what the drill was, and I was merely uh, merely executing what uh, had been agreed to. And uh, it's too bad, but I think everybody... I was delighted. Now. I was yeah. absolutely delighted to see them uh, address each other, and I wish there was even more of that. Um, uh, and I, but, you know, people, I think, did misunderstand. Now, sure. continuing with that line of thought, not long ago I had a chance to visit with... Uh, Candy Crowley, who, as you know, did the opposite of what you did in 2012 and, and corrected one of the candidates. And again, all the attention seemed to go to the moderator after uh, the debate, which makes me wonder, why would anybody accept that job? Well, you know something, I, do, I don't want to, you know, uh, blow a bugle or, or, or do a, uh, hit any drum or anything as I say this, but I think if somebody is asked to moderate, a presidential debate. If you, if somebody, if if the debate commission somehow deems you capable and qualified to do it, I don't see how you can say no. <laughs> I, I just, I think it's just, it, it, I think it's just a responsibility. It's part of your duty as a citizen to offer your skills, but not necessarily. Uh, and think of it as a, and as a, as a showbiz go or as an opportunity to audition for a better job or to become a star or any of that sort of stuff. It is a function. Uh, these debates, these presidential debates are, are a, a part of, a part of the, of, of the process that leads to electing the president of the United States. And if somebody is a moderator, he or she is also a functioning person in that process. And, uh, I don't think any moderator should see him, him or herself as an individual who has come to moderate. This is the Lair debate or the Billy Bob Dunn debate or the Wah Wah debate. This is the presidential debate uh, for the American people. And as long as people who, who do the moderating understand that, uh, they won't have a problem, no matter what they do, whether it's right or wrong or perceived to be right or wrong. Right. Well, you, you view this clearly as a service to your country. Yeah, I really do. I mean, it's as I say, it sounds corny, but uh, I really, I really do feel that way. Mm-hmm. So let's talk a little bit about the process you go through in formulating the questions. How, do, how does that come about, and how much freedom do you have to shape the questions and topics? Well, there you have absolute freedom. Uh, there has never been an attempt in the twelve that I did. No, nobody ever attempted to influence uh, what questions I would ask. Nobody from the commission. Nobody from outside the commission. Nobody from anybody's campaign. Yes, I got a lot of suggestions. I got millions of suggestions for questions uh, from individuals and from and and various special interest groups and 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 things like that. But as, in terms of somebody. Who, who could actually cause me to ask a certain question or not ask a certain question? I I never ever uh, had uh, had anybody do that, and they would have it would have been a fruitless exercise if they had tried. Uh, but in terms of of, of preparing, uh, and and you, uh, Rebecca, you know this as well as I do. Preparing for questions is really about preparing to listen. It is yes. more than it is than preparing to write questions. Anybody can write questions. Anybody can come up with questions. Uh, uh, over, you know, It may take a while, but you can come up with questions. But you've got to do your homework so you can listen to the answers because if, if you've got to be comfortable enough to be able to respond, I always – and the story I always tell is that it's never happened to me, but things like this have happened to me where, you know, somebody says to me, well, uh, uh, I asked the question, Senator, do you think we should sell more grain to Cuba? And uh, and the senator says, uh, 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 well, yes, I think I do think uh, I think we should. But before we do that, we should bomb Havana. And I say, well, what kind of grain, Senator? You know, in other words, <laughs> it goes right over, it goes right over your head. And, and a, a, a moderator or an interviewer who is so tied up in his or her questions, who doesn't hear the answers, is absolutely useless, as far as I'm concerned. Because a moderator should listen and say, think, have enough information. Hey, that that's important. I should follow up on that, or that's nothing. Or he or she said that something just the opposite of that two weeks ago, or whatever. Uh, it, it is to be able to listen, and you. Beg, but and only only way you can do that effectively is to do your homework. Well, I am so glad you brought that up because the amount of preparation that we have to do for me to do a one hour interview with any of our guests is weeks and weeks of reading videos and so oh, on and yeah. so forth because you don't know 
where the person's going to go. And you need to be able to go there with them, which means you have to cover a hundred times more material than is ever going to get out in front of the public. Otherwise, you, you, you can't go. You can't follow them. Absolutely right. And you don't know how to judge whether or not this was important, what, what Billy Bob just said. And, uh, whether, oh, my goodness, this is really significant. Well, if, 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 or, or if you're so wrapped up in your next question, you, pro- you will not hear, hear something. And if you haven't done your homework, you won't hear it well enough to be able to react properly. Uh, that, that's what it's all about. Now, along those lines, uh, do you ever discuss the general topic areas with the candidates or their handlers in advance? No, no. No, what what we did do in 2012, because it was part of the new uh, the new arrangement, uh, the moderators were asked to come up with uh, and and to announce ahead of time general areas. I see. Uh, and I did that. I did it in mine. I, I I think I had three on the economy, and and I can't, I can't remember what the other two were. But they were not they were not not questions. They were just subject areas. The idea being to try to make these things more. Uh, more serious and less gotcha oriented, and because uh, because it, but but you know the bottom line on these things, Rebecca. No matter what, how well you you uh, a candidate does in terms of subjects and and of substance and all that, which is really what what it should be all about. Yes. Also, the person, uh, the personality, uh, just the character of the candidate also comes through, particularly in a one hour, or two ninety minute, or a two hour debate. And you do you like the person? Do you think the person is is uh, is is a, is a quote, good person? How can you tell that? Well, people do make those kinds of decisions based on just listening to them or watching them in a debate. It's very important stuff. So, do you divide your questions up into content questions and then maybe more that are leaning toward character? Well, no, not unless character is an issue uh, mm-hmm. of some kind, and uh, it has become an issue. Then, then I have I I very seldom ask uh, you know blatant over the over the over the uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, over the transom character questions. Well, I and guess I, 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 once John King got nailed for that, that was sort of the end of that, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, exactly. But you know, the thing is, there are sometimes when character is an issue. And there's sometimes when it's not so much an issue. It may be perceived. I mean, character is always there. Right. And, uh, but 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 a, in other words, a character issue is this person has this person done something honest or dishonest or whatever uh, specific. Yes. Go. All right. Right. It's always there in the background of every you question. Bet. That's a good point. We have to take another short break. You bet. We'll be right back with more from Jim Lair. You're listening to the Costa Report. Big data is changing the way organizations work. From data-driven marketing and ad targeting to the connected car, big data is fueling product innovation and new revenue opportunities. It's creating a culture in which business and IT leaders join forces to realize value from all data. They infuse analytics everywhere and make speed a differentiator, gaining competitive advantage from faster, more informed decisions. Leading organizations are creating new business models, developing new roles, and defining new big data architectures, including an infrastructure that can manage and process exploding volumes of structured and unstructured data, in motion as well as at rest, while protecting data privacy and security. Find out how IBM Big Data and Analytics can transform your business. Visit www.ibm.com slash big data today. Attention homeowners, I've told you before, and if you missed out, I'm telling you again, rates are dropping to another historic low. Hi, I'm Wesley Hoagland with Westland Financial. Why pay more if you don't have to? Whether you're buying a home or refinancing, we can do this with no closing costs. That's right, no points, no fees. Even if you refinanced in the last year, we can still probably save you money. So don't delay. Call Westland Financial today at 1-800-809-7818. That's 1-800-809-7818. All it takes is a five-minute phone call to find out how you can save hundreds or thousands of dollars a year. And by the way, Westland Financial is proud to offer reverse mortgages for our clients over 62. The only way you can lose money is not to call 
Call Westland Financial. Call Westland Financial today at 1-800-809-7818. That's 1-800-809-7818. 1-800-809-7818. 1-800-809-7818. And MLS number 3304. Not all loans apply. Equal housing lender. When you see a dripping faucet these days, you run to the hardware store. But the real urgency may be the leaking we can't see. And that's the electricity leaking from the circuits inside our walls. But wait, if you can't see the trons leaking, how do you know you're safe? Let's ask the doctor of circuits, Chris Jensen from JM Electric. Chris, what can we do? Thanks, Charles. And yes, electrical leaks are a real danger. What you can't see can hurt you. You may not be able to see leaking electricity, but JM Electric's testing equipment can. Our state-of-the-art tools can find hidden dangers behind your walls. And JM Electric is happy to help folks out with a free home assessment to see if the current safe testing service is right for your home. Give us a call at 422-7819. That's JM Electric at 422-7819. Folks, don't let a leaky electrical system keep you up at night. Give my friends at JM Electric a call. They can make your home safe just like they did mine, and now I sleep better at night. Give JM Electric a call, 422-7819, or visit jmelectric.com. Tell them I sent you. I'm here with Sharon and Ron of the Bay Briar Shop, Soquel. On Porter, 3015 Porter, off of Soquel Drive. Come to the Bay Briar Shop and get Longevity products. You have probably the greatest selection of the most popular products where you can just go in and buy it with cash, right? Yes, absolutely. Uh, basically, you can come in and get the product, pay cash check or credit card, and walk out with the product. The Bay Briar Shop. 3015 Porter, off of Soquel Drive. And Soquel. What's the phone number? 475-1751. See you at the Bay Briar. Michael Olson's third law of the food chain. Cheap food isn't. They make food cheap by taking the food out of it and by making taxpayers subsidize its costs. Thus, the cheap food they promise is really the expensive food they deliver. To find true value, tune in KSEO Saturday at 9 a.m. as the Food Chain Radio Show tracks down the real deal of food. If you have a comment about the third law of the food chain, tell me, Michael Olson, all about it at MetroFarm.com. Now, see you all on KSEO Saturday at 9 a.m. for some What's Eating What Radio on the food chain. What day was that? Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and if you're just joining us, my guest today is Jim Lair. And before the break, you were explaining that uh, there are no restrictions on the questions asked by presidential debate moderators, though the general subject areas may be shared with the candidates. Um, you know, as a layman, I often wonder why certain questions are not asked. For example, one of the first things a new president must do is appoint a cabinet. So is there any reason we can't ask the candidates who they're considering for their vice presidential running mate or who's on their short list for secretary of state or secretary of defense or the treasury? I mean, in the in the long run, we're electing a cabinet, not just one person. So I, I'm always curious why moderators don't go there. <laughs> That's a good question, Rebecca. That's a very good question. And I probably should have asked it a few times, and I didn't. <laughs> well, well, I they they no. never ask it. I, I mean, I'm not singling you out as a moderator. No. I'm just saying the moderators no. never say, hey, who's on your short list? Give us a well, preview. I, I, it, it, there's a fine line, and, and, and trust me, it's a very fine line, uh, between questions that are, are more appropriate for debates versus those that are more appropriate for interviews. Mm-hmm. And if I were if I were to interview a presidential candidate, and I've interviewed a lot of presidential candidates, and I have asked that question of them, which is not a debatable point necessarily, but it could be if uh, uh, if it, if somebody I remember asking George H. W. Bush about his when he, when he was running for re-election, I just did an interview with him in Houston during the convention, and uh, I said, "What are you going to? Are you going to change your cabinet?" And he said, "Yes." And it was huge news. <laughs> it is, <laughs> yeah. And I, yeah, I mean, your point is well taken. But I, it, it, uh, but in a debate, if you, it's, it's a little bit. It, it, it is uh, actually you could ask the question. Now that I think about it, certainly there would be a way you could ask the question that would be relevant. Uh, so you could ask it, both candidates, uh, and 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 have a, a, a kind of. But I've always felt that the, that those that the debate subjects should be things that uh, that. Uh, uh, that that are are issue more issue oriented, but I but I, I I get your point. I mean, if you if somebody said, but most for the most part they say no, I will not. 
tell you right now uh, who who the who the who the candidates would be. I mean, who the who my cabinet would be, uh, cabinet officers. Would I'd be probably ask. Well, why not? Why why yeah, keep it a secret? You're going to have to tell sooner or later. Sure. Well, the, well, but, but a candidate would just say, "Well, I'll make that decision. I'm not. I'm not going to make that decision until uh, I'm elected, unless unless somebody says uh, they want. Unless they want to make a political point. Uh, I'm 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 Billy Bob, and if I'm elected president, I promise you, I'm going to make Sammy Sue my Secretary of State. And everybody, yeah, hey, 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 or All right. Ooh, ooh, ooh. And uh, <laughs> and it'd be fun to ask the uh, you know uh, the other people that are in the debate. It'd be awful fun to say, well, is his short list a good list? Would you have some of those people on your list? Sure. No. 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 You. I think you could get a really good dialogue going because, I, frankly, uh, I understand the president is the highest office in the land. But let's face it; it's who they select as cabinet. Sure, right? Sure. No, I, you know, you uh, you've made a very good point. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I well, I, I, you know, they're not going to call me up to ask questions, so I guess I can just uh, sit back and fantasize all the questions I would ever <laughs> ask, all I want to. Uh, now, I'm, gonna, <laughs> I'm not going to ask. I'm not going to do any more debates. So I can I can agree with you. It's there you go. Question too. <laughs> there you go. So it, now uh, I have another question for you. It's been sure. suggested by many people that when the candidates run uh, out their time, their microphones should be cut. Well, you know, I I've I've. I've thought about that, and uh, <clears throat> I noticed that one of the things they did in the uh, Fox debate, the Republican debate, they they had a buzzer or something, or rang a bell, and um, there was a, there was a discussion about that. Uh, I think among here again, not it's not a question that a moderator is going to decide, but I think they've had they've had uh, discussions among members of the debate commission and, and staff people. <clears throat> would it would that make sense to do some kind of sound have some kind of sound uh, so the uh, audience would understand well they've got when, countdown when the clocks in front of them don't they oh, don't sure. they yeah they've got oh, countdown sure. clocks that are telling sure. them and they know they're at zero and they just keep talking exactly. and exactly. then as a moderator you're put in a position of just being downright rude i know i know no i thought about that uh, and uh, probably in retrospect uh, that's a good idea that's two two great ideas. <laughs> well, you know, you know. well, coming from Jim Lair, I'm having a pretty, I'm having a good day today. <laughs> Where were you when I needed you? <laughs> well, you know, it, it's also been suggested, and I, this is really controversial, but uh, it's been suggested: what if you just put the candidates and their vice presidential candidates all in a room at a table with no moderator, and just okay. watched and saw what happened? Well, that's been suggested too. I, uh, <clears throat> the, the, I don't know. I, 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 I have, I, happen to, I happen to believe that something like that could be very, very interesting and very much fun to watch. But it would give a huge advantage if one of those two candidates was more glib or more articulate, and yet might have the worst ideas. But can I? You know, it could. You know, or has a personality that is a little more, uh, uh, shall we say, uh, over the top. Um, it, I, I think it could be personality. It could personality drive that kind of debate into something that might not be as pleasant as it it it, it as it looks written down as a proposal. So you feel that if there were no moderator and the candidates were just left in a room to have a one-hour discussion, that format might lend itself to people seeing more superficial criteria by which exactly to right and 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 they could become it could become one of two things it could become oh my goodness it's really great to t- get to know you and uh, you know and let's talk about this and and all of that or it could be in other words they could they could talk for 90 minutes and not say a thing but and we'd learn so much about their character wouldn't we those yeah, that yeah, became would. aggressive and right. those Absolutely that were accommodating right. um it'd be Absolutely interesting right. without any questions in advance to force them to sit in a room. But, of course, I'm a scientist, though. You know, I spent most of my career watching bonobo monkeys behind a, the lab glass. So, so you know, I don't want structure. I just say, hey, throw them in there and let's see what happens, right? Yeah. Well, you know, I think what would be a good idea if they if – they, they only have three debates. Let's say they had four or five debates and do one of them that way. You wouldn't have to do all of them that way. Do one of them. Yeah, what about this town hall format? Are you in favor of that? Well, I think it's uh, it it there's it's less town hallish than it uh than than the label implies. It uh 
uh, in the ballot in the, in the final analysis, the decisions about what questions are asked are still made by the moderator. And uh, you know, I got uh, every every town hall uh, debate that I ever moderated. There were hundreds and hundreds of questions in the process that were that I was given to choose from. Yes, and I made the final decision. And um, they don't. Uh, they and and the they they're not. It's not spontaneous in any any form. I don't know. Uh, I think it's it's possible. It's not uh, really a town hall, as you point out. No, it's almost no. like a town hall show. Exactly. Uh, right. But but That's it's right. not it's not spontaneous, and and uh, the questions are already decided. And also, there's this awkwardness in the ones where they have people sitting in the bleachers, where the candidate has to come out. And then they have to retreat back into their corner, and it just makes me physically uncomfortable. Uh, okay. It's awkward. I agree with you again. I agree with you again. <laughs> I think it's a format that works really well, but not on television. Yeah, 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 yeah. They, it's uh, here. Here's the thing, Rebecca, that everybody has to understand about these debate these, these debate formats. That a lot of it is driven, like it or not by the wishes of the candidates yes. uh, through their handlers and whatever. If somebody is really good at uh, really good on his or her feet and really, you know, smooth, what they call a, a flannel, somebody with a real flannel mouth, which is an old Texas expression, <laughs> that, that, and so that person's handlers want a wide open debate. Mm-hmm. They want a, 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 quote, town hall debate. Then the the people who only talk in in one or two minute lines, uh, they don't. They don't. They want it structured. Yeah, they they want it buttoned down. Sure. Absolutely. Now we have to take our final break. We'll be right back after these messages from our sponsors. You're listening to the Costa Report. Do you love creating salads as much as you enjoy eating them? Hi, I'm Amy Tobin, cookbook author and culinary expert. Dole inspires fresh and wholesome dishes for any meal with their wide selection of salad blends and all-natural salad kits. From the mild and tender texture of sweet butter lettuce to the crunch of classic romaine sprinkled with colorful shredded carrots and red cabbage, Dole has over 30 salad blends to satisfy every palate. If you're looking for the ultimate in convenience, try Dole's unique salad kit combinations that include farm-fresh lettuces and vegetables, mouth-watering all-natural toppings, and specially made dressings. It's all you need to make a distinctively delicious salad. The possibilities are endless. Visit www.dolesalads.com for recipes and other ideas to feed your culinary imagination. Biodiversity is the very fabric of our lives. It is everything around us, all of nature. But human impact is diminishing biodiversity at an alarming rate. And because of that, the intricate web of biodiversity is unraveling in ways we don't fully understand, and our world is becoming less resilient. That's why we are biodiversity advocates. We're the E.O. Wilson Biodiversity Foundation. Guided by the greatest living naturalist, E.O. Wilson, we champion research and education that expands our understanding of biodiversity and informs worldwide conservation efforts. The E.O. Wilson Biodiversity Foundation is building a movement of environmental stewards like you who share our sense of responsibility for the living world that is our home. Join us in our quest to protect biodiversity, the fabric of our lives. Visit eowilsonfoundation.org. For the last 60 years, Coast Paper and Supply has been serving locals and businesses for all their cleaning and paper supply needs. With an 1,800-square-foot showroom and nearly 5,000 products, you'll find everything you're looking for in the way of janitorial supplies, retail and industrial packaging, and disposable food service products for business or home, not to mention their huge selection of boxes and shipping supplies. Their family-owned and operated business is located at 151 Josephine on River Street in Santa Cruz. Call 831-423-3350 or visit Coast Paper Supply. Inc.com, a proud member of Think Local First. 
Hi, everyone. It's Kay Swirling. You haven't heard a commentary from me in quite some time because I decided to rest my brain, smoke some pot, and mellow out. Just kidding. Besides, I'm sick and tired of all those weasels who will do anything, even run over their own grandmothers if necessary, to get elected president. But since I learned that KSEO is now available to Santa Cruz County on the FM radio dial at 104.1 FM, I am so excited that I cannot remain silent. So whether you listen on air or online at ksco.com or via our free iPhone and Android apps. We are and will continue to be your favorite radio station, KSCO Santa Cruz. We're listening. It's always open house at the Mike Young Real Estate Hour, and you are always invited to walk right in and join the discussion. Hello, I am Mike Young, and I love talking real estate with all the experts and with you. So get a jump on the Real Estate Weekend every Friday, 7 p.m. on the Mike Young Real Estate Hour, right here on Listen and Be Heard Radio KSCO. The Mike Young Real Estate Hour is brought to you by Thunderbird Real Estate, Real People Selling Real Estate, by Rick Williams at American Pacific Mortgage, and by Steve Manville at Farmers Insurance. Friday at 7. See you then. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and my guest today is the man who set the standard for in-depth, nonpartisan news coverage, Mr. Jim Lair. So switching gears for just a moment here, my father used to call the media the fourth branch of government because he said that it will always provide necessary oversight, and you certainly experienced that when you covered the uh, live Watergate hearings. Um, But there's been a lot of changes since those Watergate days from the viral spread of news over Twitter to 24-hour all-news channels. Can you speak to some of the good and bad changes you, you've observed in the media? Sure. The good, the good, the good is that uh, years ago, uh, during your father's time and my time, um, uh, we had three or four ways to get the news. I mean, you get your, everybody would read their local newspaper, watch one uh, nightly news program, and maybe read Time or Newsweek, and that was it. Mm-hmm. Now there are... I mean, and if you were to go in the in the evening to uh, any kind of affair in your neighborhood or in your hometown or wherever, uh, everybody who and they started talking about the news, there would be a shared knowledge, shared set of facts that everybody would would have agreed on. And then they might start an argument about it, but at least the, the <laughs> basic the basic uh, shared information mm-hmm. would be there. That is no longer the case. And uh, now there are there are hundreds, if not thousands, uh, maybe millions of sources of information of various kinds, and some of it is 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 opinion information, some of it is historical information, some of it is gibberish, some of it is is fabulous, some of it is very perceptive, some of it is stupid, but it's it's all there, and that is a good thing in that 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 there are it's no longer. Information is no longer controlled by a handful of, uh, no matter how wonderful they may have been, because I was one of them, but no, how, no matter how wonderful they were, it was, the news was basically controlled by a handful of people. A large handful, but a handful. And now it is, it's all out there. The problem, the downside of that is just that it's all out there. And uh, people are getting bad information, and sometimes they're, the first thing they hear is an opinion rather than a fact, and they don't go back and then say, wait a minute, would, 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 uh, you're saying Barack Obama was born in, in Timbuktu? And uh, where did you hear that? Uh, or whatever it is, whatever you hear. Um, uh, or, and, and at any rate, the average person who wants to be informed just has to work a lot harder than than he or she used to, but has many more resources to do that. And uh, that's the revolution that we're still in the middle of, and uh, everybody's party party to it, both the, both the, those of us in the, in, the, in the information end and those of us in the consumer end, which is everybody, and uh, try to figure out a way to deal with all this tsunami of information that is flowing our way. Well, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, I think it's a mixed blessing here. According to Eric Schmidt, the CEO of Google, 
we're generating as much new information every 48 hours as we did from the dawn of humankind to year 2003. That means every Friday, that entire universe of information is recreated by Monday morning. So the trouble we have is the veracity of the news. That's exactly right. I couldn't agree. I mean, how do you, you know, for every story you read, there's five that uh, contradict it. And uh, and and so in some ways, when there were only three or four news outlets, at least they went through a vetting process. There was some filtering process uh, before you got the news. It's the same problem I have with electronic publishing. These days, everybody can be an author. That's right. But there's That's more right. really crappy books than at any other time in history. <laughs> because the editors, I mean, to get a book published, as you know and I know, to get a book published by a major publishing house, you really have to have a real a, a book that they're willing to bet their money on. Absolutely right. And that, and that process alone was a vetting process. Exactly right. Exactly right. And when it went through that process and it was published by a name a name uh, publisher, that had that that had a a, a a hey, I gotta pay attention to this quality to it. And now that, that no longer exists. And I agree. But the good thing is, as you, 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 we are agreeing on this, the good thing is that there are ways that you can go ahead and publish your own book or you can get other – there are other ways to do it. You can do e You can still – you don't have to sit back and say, oh, my God. They, but it's uh, also created so much junk. Oh, I know. I know. Oh, my I goodness. Know. And, and the average person, how much time do they have to really go research? I agree. I agree. This is why, the, why it's a revolution and why it's still in progress because nobody knows what to do about this. And uh, there's got to be a way to 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 access this information in a way that you don't have to spend all day doing it. And uh, that we're not there yet. No, it's it's pretty messy. We're right in the middle of it, I think, you know, and and with any change, you know, any tectonic change like this, there's going to be a messy period in between. And I think we're just in that messy period. Um, I couldn't agree with you more. We are just about out of time, but um, okay. I, I have to ask you if you're still writing and do you have a new book coming up? Because you know I've read every one of your books. I'm a big oh fan God. of your writing. Well, Becca, <laughs> you, you, you should be a member of my family because I don't think anybody else can make that statement. I'm available for adoption. Well, <laughs> I'm a little old and used, but I'm available for adoption. Um, but do you have a new book coming out? No, I, I, I've got a new book that I'm finishing, but it's uh, it's going slowly and uh, and not as well as I would like. But it's uh, it's I'm still working on it, and uh, it's, so it'll be a while. Well, as a fellow writer, I'll tell you, you never really know where you are in the book until it's done. <laughs> that is true. You got it. Amen. <laughs> So, well, that is all the time that we've got left. But before we say goodbye, I do want to take a moment to thank you for your public service and for raising the bar for all journalists everywhere. Well, Rebecca, thank you, Mr. Lair. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you very much for, for your words and for your time today and everything that you've done. Well, thank you, and I hope you'll come back soon. If your you station bet. is leaving us after this first hour and you have a question or a comment to make about our interview with Jim Lair today, you can email me at RebeccaCosta.com or drop me a note on Facebook, Twitter, or LinkedIn. How do you feel about the first GOP presidential debate? Am I being too harsh when I say the debates are looking more and more like game shows and not treated with the seriousness that electing the leader of the free world should portray? How did you feel about the questions that were asked? Wouldn't you like to know who the candidates have in mind for a vice presidential running mate or for secretary of state, defense secretary, treasury secretary, and so on? Why aren't these questions asked? Forward your comments to the contact page at RebeccaCosta.com. And if you happen to miss the full interview with Mr. Lair, remember that you can download previous episodes of the Costa Report from our website, Apple iTunes, Podbean, and our YouTube channel. And if you haven't been to the website yet, well, do that right now because it is chocked full of videos and book reviews and blogs and breaking news. And all you have to do to enjoy all of it is go to RebeccaCosta.com. It will cost you nothing and it is completely calorie free. (laughs) And while you're at the website, be sure to check out our bookstore. Because when you click on any book on the bookstore webpage, it'll take you right over to Amazon.com. And by going through our book page to get to Amazon, you help support programming like you heard today. It is absolutely true. Amazon pays the Costa Report. A small percentage of everything you buy on Amazon, if 
and only if you go to our book page first. And I mean everything. A new printer, a backpack for school, a book, a camera, even a pair of socks. No matter what you order from Amazon, they pay a royalty to the Costa Report when you go through our website to get to Amazon to make your purchases. It won't cost you one red cent. I promise. I promise. So please, the next time you're going to buy something at Amazon, go to RebeccaCosta.com and click on any book on the bookstore page. It's easy and it's a free way to support your favorite weekly news program. And I'll tell you what, folks, if you like the interview today, then you're probably a big fan of nonpartisan radio, and that is what the Costa Report is all about in the tradition of the McNeil Lair Report. We try to maintain nonpartisan journalism, and I know there's not a lot of it on the air these days. It seems like almost every program that you turn to is somehow polarized to the left or the right to gain market points. Well, we're not going to go there. We're going to continue to hold firm and be a nonpartisan radio program, and we need your support. So I hope that you'll go to RebeccaCosta.com the next time you're thinking of making an Amazon purchase, and let your friends know about it, too. My guest next week took over as executive director of the American Civil Liberties Union just seven days before the 9-11 attacks. Anthony Romero will be here to talk about the growing need to protect liberties guaranteed by the Constitution. Don't miss an honest look at post-9-11 America with Anthony Romero right here on the only news program that puts policy ahead of politics. Now stay tuned for a second hour of Straight Talk Radio. You're listening to the Costa Report. Now, if you've been listening to the Costa Report, you know that I'm on the air each and every week for one reason. It's become very difficult to separate fact from unproven beliefs. And the media, who we used to be able to rely on to tell us the difference, has become one of the worst offenders of all when it comes to making a distinction. But in addition to being on the air, I've written a book which explains why losing a grip on the facts is so dangerous. It eventually culminates in irrational public policy, something many of us worry about today. So I'm urging you to go to RebeccaCosta.com and get your copy of The Watchman's Rattle, an eye-opening book which after the first few chapters you'll be telling all your friends about. That's The Watchman's Rattle at RebeccaCosta.com. Do it now, RebeccaCosta.com. And remember, The Watchman's Rattle. Hey, buddy, it's me, your laptop. That's right, your little modern marvel of technology you've been abusing for months. Dude, we need to talk. Do you really think that those free PC Fix-It programs are any match for today's spyware and malware? Not to mention the NSA and some of those websites you've been visiting. Now, I'm not here to judge, I'm just saying. 